Hi everyone, my name is Grace Henderson and today I will be talking to you about the HACE2 gene and genetically modified mouse models to help fight COVID-19. So let me move myself around real quick, sorry about that. So I am going to just give you a um, let me show you how we're gonna go about this today. I'm gonna to give you a brief outline and the things that we're gonna go over. First, we're going to go into the background info on what GEMS are and um, SARS, COVID-19, you know, in general. Next, we are going to go on to an intro about um, the three broad categories of GEMS um, and what they are. Then we're going to go into an explanation of each model. We're gonna go into our concluded remarks, and then we're gonna kind of just take a step back and think about what does this mean for the future of the mouse model research and science as a whole. So, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, maybe some of you were in my group, but I did my last presentation uh, my short talk on why we use um, the mouse as a model system. You know, why is it that it has been so popular um, in laboratories and stuff over all these years? So I wanted to kind of expand on this um, topic and find something um, a little more timely, a little more, I guess, important and stuff to look at for now. Um, so I actually came across this article that was published very recently on October 26th of this year, um, which was called Genetically Modified Mouse Models to Help Fight COVID-19. Pretty self-explanatory, but um, it's this really awesome paper um, that I found in the scientific magazine that we all know of, or we should know of, called Nature, you know, from all the readings that we've had to do from class and everything. Um, so yeah, from Nature. And so we all know you know, with this kind of time period that we're living in with COVID-19. Um, we know that the scientific community is in a race to understand um, everything about COVID-19, including the molecular mechanisms um, all of it and just everything about it, basically. We want to know um, the ins and outs of it so that way we can find a way to stop it. We can find a cure, we can find a vaccine, we can find a way to stop um, the amount of deaths and things. So. Specifically in this paper, they wanted to look for a way to kind of repurpose um, and use what we currently have available um, in the scientific community and just like um, within COVID research in general. And just like the antiviral drugs um, that we have already. And we wanna use those to develop new therapies and vaccines against the coronavirus. So basically I feel like, I mean, I'm not a scientist fighting COVID-19, but um, I feel like a lot of companies and a lot of labs and stuff are looking, you know, outside, um, trying to find something, um, you know, new that might be out there that we don't know, which is perfectly fair. But I thought it was really cool that this paper was trying to find um, the cure for COVID or the vaccine for COVID um, using something that we already have um, already, like, you know, know a little bit about. So they do this um, in one way by using mice. So we know that mice make up 70% of all lab animal species used in biomedical research, um, but COVID-19 sadly only affects them if they've been genetically modified to express the gene human ACE2, also known as HACE2. Um, so this is really important because the gene that they have that's, you know, the mouse version of it is called MACE2, and it makes them not susceptible to COVID. So in order for us to do this kind of research, we have to genetically modify um, these mice. And we're gonna get into how um, in this presentation. So that is what um, the term GEMS stands for. It's genetically engineered mouse models. So. We already have several genetically engineered mouse models um, that express the HACE2 gene because they were created about over a decade ago um, for the use in the first SARS um, virus that came through. So we, like I said, we already have that um, kind of in our repertoire, basically. Um, 
So what's really important about this um, HACE2 gene is that that is where COVID basically comes into your cells. It's the receptor site um, for where COVID comes in. So that's basically what all this um, research is on and about. Um, so GEM, so genetically um, engineered and modified um, mice are a really cool way um, that we're doing this. Uh, these kind of like terms and like vaccines and uh, studies. So we know that COVID, um, actually we know that we don't know. We know that it is very mystifying and, and crazy and we don't really know much about um, its long-term effects. And um, uh, we know that it's mystifying because it affects not only the respiratory system, you know, where it kind of comes in through your nose or your mouth, but also many other organ systems, including your cardiovascular system, digestive, and your nervous system. And we know that's really lethal and really scary. Um, for older populations and just the population in general. So I wanted to take a moment to kind of stop and talk about, you know, how does COVID-19 enter the body, you know, um, specifically? Um, how does it get up in there? <laughs> so, um, the SARS-CoV-2 um, has a spike, is a spike glycoprotein that binds to the cell membrane, as you can see um, in this picture right here. I don't know if you can see my cursor kind of moving. Um, but it binds to the cell membrane protein angiotensin converting enzyme, which is that ACE2, um, to enter the human cells. So where's my cursor? So here is that, um, here's COVID, <coughs> um, look, pretty menacing. And it comes into this receptor site, um, which is the ACE2 right here. And basically that's where it kind of like locks on. Um, and so, like I said, this is a really difficult disease because so many organs are affected. Um, but, however, if we had an animal model that um, allowed for productive infection of only one type of tissue or cell, um, so for example, only like cardiac tissue or only neural tissue, um, we could um, study it better because the model will allow us regulation um, of the dose, timing of the infection, and it could be you know, more helpful and useful. So we really want an animal um, uh, model system basically that's gonna allow us to kind of play God, to kind of go in um, and allow us to infect as much as we want for how long as we want, a certain amount we want, and that kind of thing. And we know that that's a possibility with these mice, with these genetically engineered mice. So to kind of further my point on that, um, I found a recent report that was actually in that um, article that I found originally that was talking about the expression pattern of the ACE2 gene in human tissues. So it showed that the ACE2 gene seemed to be very low in um, lung cells, which is actually really surprising because we know that it you know, comes in through that way. Uh, but it's detected in really high levels in more than 150 other cell types corresponding to 45 tissues. So this observation, observation, excuse me, further highlights the importance of kind of like zooming in and finding that specific spot in a specific model to look at um, hyper specific areas of concern. So we basically to break that down, um, we know that COVID is, does not just stay in that one locus of the um, respiratory cells, but it branches out. It kind of like metastasizes basically. Um, so it's really important that we can have a specific model that we can control ourselves, which are those gems, those genetically engineered um, mouse models. So to continue, like I said, this type of controlled experimental design is possible only in mice um, because of the genetic tools and molecular switches that are readily available to be read into the multiple cell type tissues um, that we already have on file. You know, so just kind of furthering what I said before. Um, it's really up to mice basically and us um, to try and figure this out because a lot of the other animals that they have like in laboratories just do not have this gene at all or they're just straight up like not susceptible to COVID. Um, so it's really cool that we can go in with these genetically engineered mice um, and kind of play God, like I said. So furthering with the outline, let's just kind of go into um, the different models that they use. So this paper is really cool because it brings up um, three different models um, of the gems that they used and what they think um, would be best. 
So the first one that we're going to get into, I'm going to move myself over here, um, is uh, the GEMS one. So I'm going to kind of briefly go into this one. Um, this is called the knocking in expression cassettes um, or point mutations into the endogenous mouse ACE2 locus. Um, so for this um, first category, um, if you look on the picture on my right, we can see that the mouse ACE2 gene is deleted, called a knockout, um, and the human ACE2 cDNA is inserted into its place, um, which is really cool and really just kind of like what the whole point of like this whole thing is, basically. Um, so this is only possible because both mouse and human ACE2 genes are located on the X chromosome, um, and each contains 19 exons. Um, the mouse introns are larger, but you know, that's okay. Um, so basically what they do is they go in and they delete the region between the start and the stop codons of the mouse ACE2 gene. Um, and then they go in and they insert the human ACE2 gene. Um, and this model design, you know, it sounds like really easy when I'm explaining it to you, um, but this model design would be quite difficult, they say in the paper, because, um, it requires a very precise meticulous placement of all those 19 mouse exons um, with the corresponding human exons, as you can see on the picture to my right. Um, and so not only is this um, not as cut and dry as it appears to be, but this method has also been known for a really long time um, because, or excuse me, it was, but it was tossed to the side because of um, the amount of time that it was taking and the amount of money that it needs basically to um, continue. Um, but now with basically the added pressure of COVID-19, you know, kind of bearing down on us um, in the scientific community, um, and also with the advancement of certain technologies such as CRISPR, um, we, you know, might see some results as they say in this paper. So this was just one method that they brought up basically. Um, the second model that they bring up is the GEM2 method, and this one is called the knocking in CRE um, activity table HACE2 expression cassettes into safe harbor loci, um, which is basically a kind of like re-engineering. So I'm going to break down those words. Um, so I think that this scenario is um, pretty interesting um, because they said in the paper that it's considered the most safe option. Um, because um, in this um, method, sorry for saying um so many times, um, you're likely not to produce potentially um, hazardous virus particles in this experiment because you have the ability to kind of switch on and off. So I'm going to explain that a little bit more. So this one is a more specific scenario than the first one. Um, it requires a gem expressing HACE2 gene in only one of the respective cell types. Ideally, in this expression, um, like I said, it could be switched on and off when needed. Um, so as you can see on this diagram on my left, they're going to go in and use Cre, lox p and the tetracycline, sorry, inducible systems to go in using data from um, the genetics community and th so they're going to go in and remove the stop cassette and express the insertion cassette and then breed mice um, with those genes. Um, a cassette, uh, we're going to hear about this in the third method as well, but a gene cassette is a small mobile um, element, you know, kind of like think of a cassette basically um, music-wise, like the old ones. I hope everyone knows what those are. Um, hopefully, I don't think we're that young. Um, but so they're just kind of like a small, compact, mobile unit um, that cannot move by themselves. They include a specific site that allows them to be recognized by site-specific recomb uh, recombinants, recombinants, sorry. Um, and they're usually found in like a specific location and they include a single gene or a single um, open reading frame, which I know that we've talked about a lot in class. So yeah, so that's what a cassette is, just just think like a condensed, like really important hyper-specific area. Um, so they use that CRE and LOXP um, technology to go in using data that we already have. Um, and so they're gonna go in and remove that cassette, ex like switch it on, you know, express the insertion cassette, and then 
they will um, breed mice that have that um, whole system going on basically. And then they can just switch it off whenever they need to. Beautiful thing, uh, gene expression. Now we're going to go on to the third. And the third method is called the knocking in CRE activatable cassettes into the mouse ACE2 locus. So this one is kind of a kind of like a combination of all of them basically. Um, this combines the knocking in expression cassettes um, with conditional potential. So this one is really um, ad not advertised. This one enticing. Excuse me. This one is really enticing um, to scientists because it can be generated really rapidly using something called CRE driver lines. So basically, what happens in here um, is that CRE activated inversion cassettes. Um, we know what cassettes are. We just talked about those expressing the HACE2 and also a mutant combo of the LOX P are inserted into the intron 1 of mouse ACE2. So here, here's our intron 1. And so they're going to go in and insert that right here. Um, number two, the coding sequences are then placed in the opposite orientation to the MACE2 promoter, and they will be inverted using CRE technology, which will put them in the correct orientation to be expressed from the mouse ACE2 promoter. So basically, in layman's terms, they're going to go in, put that, um, put this in here, um, upside down, basically, and then the technology is basically going to allow it to flip to the right um, way and also in the right direction, basically. Um, so this one is really cool because it's very technical and also it's very speedy. Um, yeah, so those are the three um, gems that they bring up, the genetically uh, modified mouse models. And now we're gonna kind of go into, you know, why did I just spend all this time talking to you about this, basically? Um, so as we know, COVID-19 is a new disease. Um, there was the previous version, you know, like about 10 years ago, but it wasn't as crazy um, as it is um, now. It is um, rebirthed, kind of. So there's a lot of unknowns. Um, like I said, we don't know a lot about its long-term effects. Even in some of the papers I was reading about the way that COVID comes in um, through the nose, they're not even really 100% sure like that that's the definite way that it comes in and affects the cell. Um, but that's just what they know so far, which is basically all of science, you know, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, and some other things that we don't know is it's um, pathogen pathogenicity, um, excuse me. Um, and pathogenicity is the capacity of a microbe, so of the COVID, um, to go in and cause damage. So like I said, we don't know its long-term effects. We don't know um, even all the different like symptoms and bad things that can happen to you, basically. I know there have been a lot of varying, of course, there's like rashes. Um, some people, you know, are not symptom symptomatic. They don't even show signs of COVID at all. Um, and there's just a range of things from like fever to the rash, like I said, to, um, severe um, like lethargy and just being like tired all the time so it's a really interesting really scary really um, just just a crazy disease basically um, so to kind of tie back that into our um, mice discussion over the last century the lab mouse has been bred to produce an extensive catalog of inbred hybrid and outbred strains of mice which collectively provide an elegant system of suitable uh, material for studying many human disease conditions. So like I said, without mice, we um, would not be able to do the research that um, we are doing right now um, within the study and in many other studies as well um, to kind of try to get a hand on COVID basically. Um, and I think it's really cool and uh, really interesting. So, you know, for kind of like some real world application and just kind of some takeaways, you know, thinking about the mice as a model system in science, I know that there was a lot of talk um, in a lot of articles that I've read 
and um, just like what I've learned in school and stuff that we thought, you know, we were kind of like done with the mouse um, as a model system, you know, like within the lab. We kind of thought that we knew everything that there was to know. We considered it pretty antiquated and we were looking on to new things like jellyfish and monkeys and even sea elegance, you know. Um, so I think it's really interesting um, that we can still advance on stuff that we already have and stuff that we already know about. Like we are not done with the mouse at all, basically. Um, and as I said, like in my last talk, we already know that mice are the ideal research models um, in comparison to humans because of their size, their breeding, their life cycle, their cost. Um, it's very, um, very cheap and you know like easy um, and I just think it's really interesting because you know what seems uh, for this to be such a terrible time um, in the world is um, also you know it's kind of interesting because it's like it brings upon like this terrible time like you know oh COVID like all these people are dying but at the same time we are on such a brink of scientific knowledge and greater understanding um, within the community, uh, within the scientific community, um, because these kind of terrible things force scientists and force everyone basically within the um, scientific discipline um, to want to learn and want to discover more and to want to learn and discover more at faster rates. Um, and so I think that it really just kind of brings upon this discussion um, that it has a really like interesting, like delicate and philosophical, philos excuse me, a really delicate and philosophical balance um, to, you know, to science in general. It's kind of like this beautiful dance between life and death and knowledge and understanding, you know, like you can't have one without the other. It's unfortunate that it is the way it is, but that is life and I think that it's incredible and that we have the ability to learn those things. Um, and it's just kind of, it's just kind of crazy. It's just kind of interesting. Um, so that is my presentation. Here are my references, as you can see on the right. Um, thank you so much to Dr. Bobby and to Miss, um, Mata for helping us with our class and everything. Um, but yeah, that's all for me. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that you have a great rest of your day or night or whatever when you watch this.